afternoon, everybody. In wondering what topic I might pick, I thought I'll talk about money. <laughs> Do you know of the 38 parables that you find in the Bible that Jesus gave? 19 of them are about money and possessions. So it's got to be important, correct? I tell you, it'll become plain to you how important it is. To be shrewd or to be wise. There's a difference, folks. There's a difference. Jesus tells the story of the shrewd steward. He says there was a certain rich man who had a steward. And this particular steward had an accusation against him. It was brought against him that this man was wasting his goods. He was helping himself. Yes, he was. And so he was reported, and of course you understand, the rich man obviously pulled him in. So he called him and he said to him, what is this what I hear about you? Now note what he's saying here. Give an account of your stewardship. Give me the books. Give me the breakdown. Get me the balance sheets. Get me the spreadsheets. Get me the check butts, everything. And give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be. He is going to get the sack. And he knows it because he has been cooking the books. It's not just politicians who do that. <laughs> no. So he knows. Now he starts thinking. And he, he thinks to himself this. The steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. He knows he's going to be on the unemployment heap. And notice, notice, he says, I cannot dig. He can, but he doesn't want to. He said, I cannot dig and I'm ashamed to beg. Now he starts thinking. You know, when real trouble looms, it's when people start thinking. And he now, I want you to see this, he now starts to think outside the box. He is actually going to start thinking about others. When the stewardship should be taken from him, he would have nothing to call his own. Are you getting the picture? What, you, know, you know people, they, they have flashy cars, they live in a nice place, everything is good until they lose their job because the house belongs to the company, the car belongs to the company, and they're not getting any more salaries. How much is left? Nothing. So he, he now starts thinking, and have a good look, have a good look what this buffet is doing. He's good. He's good. He says, I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Now, who is they? Well, the next verse will tell you, of course. You see, instead of gathering for himself, he now must impart to others. He's still in the job. He still has the control of the checkbook. He's got to give an account. He's got very little time left. He better makes the most of it, right? Well, that's exactly what he's doing. Look what he's doing. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him. This is what he does. And he says to the first, look this, how much do you owe my master? And the man gives a reply and he says, well, I owe a hundred measures of oil. Okay. He says to him, so he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write down 50. He gets a 50%. Oh, it's my bank that I would go to could do things like that. He gets a 50% discount. Nice one. Wouldn't you like him? You would at least ask him for dinner, wouldn't you? And if he said, could I bunk out here just for a few weeks? He said, sure, sure. I don't know how much 100 measures of oil is. But anyway, so, so he's looking good here. He's making friends. He's making friends. He, there's another one. 
and he must have gone through all of them. He says, what do you owe my master? And he says, this is an agricultural society, a hundred measures of wheat. And he says to him, uh, you know, take your bill, write down 80, 20% discount. Not as good as the previous one, but hey, worth a couple of meals, all right? Maybe a bit of a stay. You, you know what he's doing? He's making friends. Now, he's very dodgy because that's not his property. But hey, he's going to get the sack. <laughs> he's going to be unemployed. Who's going to look after him? He doesn't want to dig. He doesn't want to bag. There's not much left. He wants the bloods of all the people that he's now reducing the debts of. Can you see what he's doing? It's clever, isn't it? Well, I think it's clever. I think it's clever. Now, and then the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. Now, this is not God's opinion, you understand. This is not the opinion of Jesus. But he's not commending him. But the, the man who owes, he said, this is a clever guy. And then he makes this statement. For the sons of this world, the secular people, are more shrewd in their generation, you know, today's world. Today's world, the secular people are more shrewd than the sons of light, the churchy people. You know what I mean? Now, that's very interesting. Who is Jesus speaking to? Well, uh, he is speaking to his disciples. He's surrounded by them. It always used to be like that. And then immediately around them, you have the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the priests, the Jews who thought they knew everything. Ever, know, ever meet anybody who knows everything? Well, there were lots of them. And they were always there around Jesus trying to find fault. You understand that? <coughs> and of course... <laughs> this message is for them. The, this shrewd steward really represents Israel. See, Israel has been entrusted with immense wealth, the oracles of God. And what have they done? They have helped themselves but they never imparted it properly to others. Are you with me? Misappropriation. Misappropriation doesn't have to be about money. It can also be about the gospel truth. And hey, that could be true for spiritual Israel too. Okay? You've got to start thinking like that. So it has an application. Now, Jesus said this, I say to you, Make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon that when you fail in case, now that can be explained in various ways, go bankrupt or die, and that of course it has a, the afterlife in mind, they may receive you into an everlasting home. If you start thinking in terms of even dirty money, if you like, if you start giving it to others, you may do a lot of good. You understand? He said, start, start thinking differently. It's not that he's commending that you should have the conduct of this shrewd steward. Of course, he's very dishonest, right? He ought to be locked up, and he probably might have been. And then he makes this statement. He says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. Let me, let me give you an example. Somebody once said, if I make a million dollars... I'd have no trouble giving God 10%. He was only making about $30,000. And God was not getting the 10%. Are you getting the drift? If you can't do it on 30000 you are not going to do it on a million either. I'll bet you. I'll put money on it. And it'll go to the church. Don't worry. <laughs> now, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. If you nick a little bit because that's all you get or lay your hands on, if you put in a position of trust, you nick a lot. 
That's what happens. It is an attitude, isn't it? It's an attitude. It's a principle, a living principle from within. True? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, now let me explain about mammon. Mammon was a Canaanite god of wealth. So when we talk about mammon, we talk about money. I mean, real money, okay? Wealth. He says, therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, not with your money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? I want you to think for a minute. Suppose, here you are, you've been going to church for decades. And you've noticed you have not really progressed over the last decade. You're not closer to God. You sort of have that same off and on, sort of a distance. Might it be that you haven't been quite faithful in the money side of things? This is serious business. Decades ago, when somehow I was making a bit of money, I remember one time driving home, this home, 40 square home, whatever it was, there was another one on the back, and I pulled over with the car that, nice car and all. Do you know I got out of the car and I thought to myself, this is a long time ago, I shouldn't be living here. I shouldn't. I know how the rest of the world makes out. I shouldn't even be driving this car. You should see the surfaces on that car. And it grew in my mind that I had to get away from that. And I lost interest of making money. I mean, I like to get paid. Don't get me wrong, okay? But do you know what I mean? I just lost interest. It's just nothing. And, and you feel better when you can do that, isn't it? Yep, yep, that's true. So he said, how can I, how, the true riches is the knowledge of God, how can I hope to progress in my understanding? How can I expect to be closer to my Savior if I only look after number one in the money side of things? Does that make sense to you guys? Good, very good, okay. That's not it yet. We're only not even halfway yet, okay? And if you have not been faithful in what is another... another <laughs> See, in other words, uh, let me explain that in today's terms. Uh, suppose you're employed somewhere. I remember I once had a secretary. You should have seen the phone bill. She had a, a sister in Melbourne. Don't I know it? You should have seen the phone bill, always on the phone to the sister. Now, that's stealing, in my opinion, particularly if you don't pay for it. You know, people do that. They help themselves. They go to, and they have their pockets full, or they help themselves with this. They're not necessarily breaking into the safe, but they get this from work. They get that from work. Uh, I remember, I remember <laughs> when I just got into Australia, I had a dog worker for a patient, and he said, Doc, he said, whatever you want, I'll get it. What an offer. And that included whiskey as well, by the way. <laughs> anyway. So if you're not being faithful in what is another man, because that's stealing, you see, if you're not, who will give you what is your own? Would you really expect God to put you in a position of wealth if you have not been faithful in the wealth of another person who most likely employed you? Make sense? Oh, very much. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, love the other. Now, you meet people who say, I'd like to have both. But one will be a favorite. And so there's a, there's a Middle Eastern expression, typically, you, whichever one you prefer is the one you love, and the one that comes second best is then the one you hate. You understand what the terminology is here, okay. 
No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. That is what Jesus said. You know, you can't concentrate on just making money and then expect to grow in your spiritual life. When are you going to study the Bible? When are you going to support that church of yours? You will not do that because Satan will make sure there is always something that you have to attend to. And hey, it's not just about money, folks. It's really about your time. It can be about your studies. It can be about your studies. You top it up too much and God gets sure changed. He gets to change, you understand. Whether he gets to change, we'll come back to that about that as well. You understand, if God doesn't get your best, do you expect him to give you the best? Not really. So, so he will either hate the one, love the other, and, uh, and, uh, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You understand? You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't chase the almighty dollar and serve God as well. I think that is no argument about this at all. We all can understand this. Okay, this is good. Now, the Pharisees, who were very close range, hated what he said. They were lovers of money. They heard all these things and they derided him. They disagreed with him. Of course they would. They had a roaring trade on the temple. They had temple money. They had exchange money, understand. And they were ripping the system off no end. It was a roaring trade that they were doing. It was horrendous. And he said to them, he said, you are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your heart. Now, here is a principle. You know, when you're not quite doing the right thing, let's put it this way, when you are doing the wrong thing. Isn't it amazing how you can justify yourself? It's good, isn't it? I love it when people come up with explanations when you try to talk to them and teach them. And they have all the explanations. You know what? I've heard them all because I've used them all too. <laughs> and none of them were any good. They, they just were no good. It's an excuse. You understand. And so, and so uh, our own sins always, by the way, seem to be a lot worse if perpetrated by someone else. It's true too. It's true <laughs> Now, God knows the hearts, the mind, you see. What is highly esteemed amongst men is an abomination in the sight of God. Just because we approve of it doesn't mean God approves of it, yeah? And by the way, by the way, you got to start thinking. It's not men's approval you are in need of. It is God's approval that we must be seeking. True. Now, Remember him, the rich young ruler. He comes on a clear day. He sees Jesus with the children. He sees the love. It's palpable. They love each other. And he thinks to himself, I've got everything, but I don't have that. And he, he's very genuine. He's very sincere. And he runs up to Jesus, apparently in full daylight, and he kneels before Jesus, and he says, good teacher. Note the question. What good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? What is wrong with the question? Huh? Yeah, what shall I do? No, that's not how it works. He should have asked, what should I be? Now, that would have been a good question. That would have been a very good question. And you remember what Jesus, how he, Jesus meets him where he is at. Very kindly. Gently. And uh, you know the story. He says, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor. Now, that went up like a lead balloon. Because he had many possessions. What law did he break? He said he had kept them all for his use. What law did he break? He covered it. <clears throat> but, you know, you might say, you might say, what would he cover? His neighbor's house? No, he already owned it. What, what, was, what was the commandments that he would break? Oh, come on. Huh? Another God. Very good, Dimmy. That is exactly right. He's got another God. His possessions are another God. 
And Jesus goes to the core of the problem and he says, get rid of it. Get rid of it. And give it to the poor. That's what he should be doing. And you will have treasure in heaven. You know, treasure in heaven is when you have contributed to the eternal life of another person. It's not a collecting of brownie points. No, no, no. It is really your contribution, think of this, to the welfare, to the purpose and the result of eternal life of someone. You know, you know what would be wonderful when you walk in that city of God? Because it's going to be our home. If you could run into people who would say, I'd like to thank you for what you did. And you might not even remember it. But it'd be nice, wouldn't it? Well, that's treasure in heaven, you understand, for your contribution, whichever way. Now, and then he says, and come and follow me. See what he's got to do. He says, if you want to be perfect, he was pretty good already, by the way. He said, you've got to get rid of that other God that you have. And then, and then it, you give it to the poor, that's good. And then you have to follow him. Don't just do what you're supposed to be doing. You really, this is, con this is, this is the key. You have to come after him and follow him. Do you understand? You can do all the other things, but if you don't follow him, you're not going anywhere. You have to follow him. And we know the story, he walked away. We never know what happened in the end of him. But it's a sad story. It's a sad story. The book of Malachi, talking about money. Will a man rob God? Well, you have robbed me, God says. Rob God? How did we rob you? How can you rob God? Here is the answer. In tithes and offerings. Now, not tipping. Oh, let me have a quick word about this. I knew I should have had the collection after the sermon. <laughs> we can always have a second one. <laughs> if I see it, you really take to it, I might consider. <laughs> you see, we give God the leftovers. You go to the restaurant, and uh, it's been nice, and they have been courteous, they have been, and, oh, just leave it, just leave it. Sometimes people really go over the top. But anyway, uh, the change, you, don't, you won't miss it. Do you know we really should bring to God the first fruit? You know the term tithing, it comes from the word ten. Yeah? Do you know what ten means? It's a perfect number. It's a number of completion. There are two numbers of completion, seven and ten. Seven pertains to time, and ten means everything. Every time you tithe, folks, every time you tithe, you say to God, everything belongs to you. You are a steward of everything that you have. And to make sure that you don't get greedy, you give him 10%. Well, the church, because they employ and operate the system of ministry, etc. That makes sense? And then on top of that, you could and should, and uh, I recommend it, free will offering. Whatever is in your heart. It's a wonderful thing. This church does not check your books to make sure you do. It's between you and God. But would you rob God? Would you? Well, see, they were. They weren't giving him the 10%. They were tipping. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. See, it was used also to provide for the poor. Now, he says, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. You know, God is asking you to test him. If you tithe, in if you tithe, I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing, he says, that there will be no room 
not enough room to receive it. That necessarily, that blessing necessarily does not come in the form of money. In case you, you were after a quick buck, okay? Blessings come in many ways, correct? There you are. Listening to the word of God is a blessing, particularly if you take it on board. Very much so. God is challenging us. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves do break in and steal, and don't we know it? But lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. That's good counsel. That's good counsel. Sermon on the Mount. And this is true, isn't it? Where your treasure is, there your heart is, and the heart is the mind. You understand? To the Hebrew, that's the mind. You know, I, I meet these people, they have a lot of money, they're quite wealthy. And they're always thinking of money or worrying about it. It can be a very, <laughs> very fine line. They always are. They're always talking about it. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Oh, this is a great story. You love this story. It's a great... I, I thought to myself, I'll tell you, I'll share this one with you. Lubeck is a place in Germany. And there was a, a monastery. That probably building is probably built after on that site. <clears throat> At about 1340, 46, 47 AD, there was what is called the bubonic plague, which is the, the, the worst plague that, that ever occurred in Europe. It killed something like 25, 30% of the populace. It was horrendous. The plague... It was ravenous all throughout Europe. And there was this monastery, you see, there was this monastery, and these monks and these priests decided that they were going to sit this one out. They had veggie pets, they had uh, water, you know, with the pumps, they had food. Uh, I mean, they could, they could stay in that, in that monastery, uh, and they locked and bolted the, the doors. They could stay there for as long as they liked. Now, let me tell you what happened. What happened is they decided, they decided uh, they weren't, that nobody was going to get in. And nothing from the outside world was going to get in. There would be no contamination. Get it? And the people came to this monastery, and you know what they wanted to do? They wanted to give money because they thought God was angry with them. And they knocked on the door and they wanted to give money. They said, we want to make a donation. And they said, go away. We would never do that here. <laughs> and they said, they said, they, well, I'm just telling you the truth, don't I? And, so, and, and they said, they don't want to know. Do you know what they did? They took the money, silver plates and everything, and they threw it over the wall. Incredible. It was raining, gold and silver. And you know what the monks did? They were getting it and they were throwing it back. <laughs> we would never do that either. <laughs> and, and that went on and on for a couple of hours. And in the end, the monks are... <sighs> <sighs> and they gave up. And they kept on throwing three, four feet high in certain places. They wouldn't touch it for weeks, for months, and some say even for years. What a story. What a story. Why? Why was that? Well, you see, there were two philosophies here. The people thought that the money would bring them life, security, forgiveness, buy your way out. Not true. And the monks thought that the money would bring them death, could be contaminated. <laughs> you ever wish you were born in a different time and different place? Anyway, that's the story of Lubeck. It's a true story, by the way. It's a true story. Now, I like this man. He said this. What about poverty? Poverty is not an accident. It's not. Actually, poverty is quite obscene. We shouldn't have it. It's a maldistribution of what's available to everybody. Like slavery, he said, and apartheid, it is a man-made... And it can be removed by the action of human beings if the political will, the moral will was there, it could be done. It's true. It's true. He's right about that. 
Overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity. It is an act of justice. Right? Would you agree with that? 100%. That's the correct statement. Oh, do you know him? <laughs> KFC. <laughs> That's nice, isn't it? Now before, oh, you already know his name. That's him. Yeah, that's him. That's him. <laughs> Colonel Harland David Sanders. Now let me tell you about it. Before you start judging this bloke for making such fattening food, <laughs> let me tell you the story. He started off from nothing. He slept out of the back of his car. He found that recipe that he, that he uh, uh, secured by registering. And he tried to sell his secret recipe to the restaurants. And, and then as it happened, him and his wife started this gasoline uh, outlet. And he put a restaurant next to it and he was selling this chicken. And he was doing very well. And he started another restaurant and another one and another one and another one. And he sold out for millions. And now, of course, it is worth billions around the world. You know what is fascinating about that man? He gave a promise to God that he would be faithful. That's not known about him. That he would be faithful in giving God 50% of all that he had. And he did. He supported the church. He, he financed institutions of learning, bought Bibles, put ministers through their theological training. That's exactly what he did do. So next time, it mightn't taste quite so bad <laughs> if you got into it. You understand? <laughs> uh, sorry? Ah, that's a good question. He belonged to an... Um, it'll come to me in a minute, that church. It was not, not the best-known church, well-known church, but it was a good church, like a universal church. I think that's what it was. Oh, uh, no, no, yeah, but a Dutchman wouldn't do that, would he? <laughs> no, he was American, folks, he was American. The colonel, he was American. Oh, yes, bred and born and bred. Here. Yeah, uh, Rita. Swimming in it or drowning in it? Take your pick. Have a look at him. Looks good. By the way, no ashtrays in heaven, if that's where he was hoping to go. No booze either. You know, in worldly standards, he's swimming in it. But in a spiritual sense, you're drowning. I don't know what he uses for soap. I'm just saying, that man, I would say to you, that man is drowning. Because if you can do things like this, in a matter of speaking, and you ignore how the other, in excess of half of humanity lives. I think you have something. Uh, remember, remember, he said, the rich man called him to account because the man was misappropriating. Hoarding for yourself wealth is misappropriating. That's what it is. It, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. Abram was very wealthy. But every penny belonged to God. Every sheep, every cow, whatever he had, camel, whatever. So, I don't know how pleased you would have to be, particularly if the day comes when you have to give an account. Sometimes pictures tell a thousand words. I, when I look at pictures, like I used to go to India years ago, decades ago, and, and I... I always reckon that you could tell the poverty in the eyes of the children. Horrible. I could never get used to it. I always had a pocket fish change, but before you start giving, there's a whole lot of them. Oh, mate, before you know it. And my friend and I, we, we, we were there for business, he said, you've got to stop doing this. You've got to stop doing this. But I hate to see and, and the abuse that comes with it. It's a shocking world we live in, really. It is, really. Assuredly, I say to you, in as much as you did it, and to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. There's one thing about our God. 
he cares about the disadvantaged. And if it touches you when you look at them, I'm telling you, it touches him infinitely more because Jesus went to the cross for each and every person that even has died today of starvation, malnutrition, or violence. We live in a cruel world. We do. We do. And so, the means, I love this statement, that comes from the pen of Ellen G. White. The means over and above the actual necessities of life are entrusted to man to do good and to bless humanity. I like that. Now, that makes sense to me. And I concur with that 100%. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Isn't that true? Supermarket. I hate supermarkets. I never can find anything in the supermarket. It's normally right in front of me. But, but, but you know the expiry dates? Have a look at it. Most of the stuff is all... See, see, see the, 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 you know, you're not supposed to drink it after that. Is that right? So many things are perishable. It all has an expiry date. And, you know, I look at it sometimes. All of us have an expiry date, you know. Yeah. Really, technically speaking, there is only, you know, and it's, it's a thing that we have to live with. There's only one thing that has no expiry date. This one. It's eternal. It's eternal. This is where you've got to turn to. This is what you've got to take in. You've got to make a decision that you do that. Because you're wasting your life. If you didn't, you really would. So, no expiry date here. Nobody leaves that on my front door. <laughs> Be interesting. Which one, though, if you look at these two, is the greatest treasure? I knew you'd say that. Mind you, if they put on your doorstep, they rung your bell and they run away and they left that big box of Gold, whatever, or the Bible. Which one do you pull inside the house first? <laughs> okay. ah, I might test you. I might test you one day. But I want the money back. <laughs> you, see, you see, the wonderful thing about the Bible is this. What is the most wonderful thing about that Bible? What's the wonderful thing about it? Man is being used. Somebody spent hours and hours and hours. I've gone through a number of Bibles like that. The one that I have is falling apart too, but I can't quite want to get rid of it. I've got notes in it. I've got references in it. I, I know my way in it, but I've got to, yeah, one day I'll have to get another one. I, I've got them. I've got them. So, you know, don't, I've got them. But sometimes... You look at the old Bible and you think to yourself, it's falling apart, but you think to yourself, the tremendous gift that came through that book, I wouldn't, I wouldn't swap it with anything. Really wouldn't. All right? Quick remark. You see, now that's a woman thinking, you see. <laughs> I love it. But you make a very good... Uh, okay, when it happens, uh, call me and I'll help you with the other one on the right <laughs> side. <laughs> okay. Woman, you see, they're clever. They really are. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, this looks like a very expensive gravesite. I got across the internet and I got, and I got this one. Hang on a minute. No such thing as dying a millionaire. Somebody said to me, such and such a person died, you know, had nothing to begin with, died a multi, a multi-millionaire. And I said, no, that it didn't. Because you all have the same wealth when you die. Whatever it is, you, <laughs> you can't take it with you. Mind you, some people try. I want you to have a look at this one. This is quite unique. I found this on the internet. That, that is actually a gravesite. It's like a living room. Can you see the, the favorite chair, all the bits and pieces, probably makeup and all the other stuff, favorite statue, uh, uh, there might be a flat screen, I don't know. This is a gravesite, folks. They're going to put a lid on that. There's the coffin. They're going to put a lid on it and a, you know, a whopper of a stone. That's what they're going to do. 
Can you understand that? This is humanity gone mad. There's only one worse example that I know of, and that is the Taj Mahal, which means the crown of palaces. It's from Urdu, an ancient language. There was in the uh, 17th century the, an, a Muslim mogul by the name of Shah Yahan, and he built this for Muntas Mahal, his third wife. Yeah. When she died, he, it's a mausoleum, you understand? That's all the beautiful example of Persian uh, uh, Islamic art or, or architecture. It's magnificent uh, to look at. It's in a place called Agra there in India, and, and uh, it is fantastic. It's all marble. In the sunset, it looks absolutely spectacular. But why? What for? What for? I love my wife too, but I'm not going to build one of those, I can tell you this much. <laughs> Money is either our God in our minds, or it is God's tool in our hands. You see, it all depends, it all depends how you look at it, isn't it? Money is either our God in our minds or it is God's tool in our hands. It depends on whose money we think it is. True? Absolutely. The story about the foolish rich man here. He has a bumper crop. And instead of giving away of the excess that he has, what he don't need, he builds bigger barns and he says to himself, I can relax now. You get these people. You know, I remember this one particular, what's the time? Am I running a bit over time here? I haven't got a watch. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Fred <laughs> says keep going. Always. No, I just want to keep an eye on the time a bit. What? Huh? Nobody can tell me the time. Oh, is it already? Oh, but you... you I was off to a late start, wasn't I? I'm almost finished. <laughs> now, now, he suddenly finds that his life is required of him. I used to have this insurance agent for years and years and years. He was always on the money, never wanted to know about God, never anything like that. And he phoned me, he phoned me one time. He said, you know, I'm getting 9%. I'm getting 9% on my money from the solicitors. He died two weeks later. He knew he was terminally ill and he was absolutely over the moon. He got 9% on his money from the solicitor. I hope that his kids got it from the solicitor. Crazy. That is losing perspective, isn't it? Absolutely losing perspective. Money is a great servant, but it is a terrible master. It's a terrible master. Everything in our possession is either a tool or an idol. True? Yes, it is. And you know what? The choice is ours. You can choose about this. You don't have to be rich, right? To be greedy. Yeah? Okay, there you go. Not everybody gets converted. That's greed. That's greed. I don't know why governments allow this. I really don't. The misery, the absolute sheer misery of people addicted, addicted to gambling. What it does to families. All funded, of course, by taxpayers' money. Wouldn't you be better off to buy this? It's a shocker. You know, I, I, I sometimes go and I sit there and I watch these people in the casino and I sit there and these people are just like this. They're not interacting. You know, they could be anywhere. <laughs> I reckon I'd be good at it, actually, to come to see. <laughs> and so, you know, the people that make these things will tell you they make them, they make them so you can't win. Oh, they do. Oh, you didn't know. See the money I saved you. No, no, it's all right. Okay, all right. Here's another story. Here's another story. Now, mate, got to move on. Uh, ever heard of him, Roy Rogers? Yeah? The, the, the singing cowboy. Yeah? Huh? Yeah, yes, he was. He was. Yes, 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 he was. But leave, leave that aside. Dale Evans, who was that? That was his wife, you see? Now, he, here, here is something you should know. Dale Evans 
This girl here, who co-starred with him, she was a, uh, a singer-songwriter. And uh, at the age of 14, she eloped, got married, had a kid at 15, had three, had three, uh, no, uh, Roy Rogers was her fourth marriage. It was two. He was married already three times. Now, before you condemn these people as a typical Hollywood no good people, I want you to think. They were married for 51 years. One. True love at last then. They had a child which suffered from Down syndrome. The child died just before the second birthday of complications of that syndrome. She turned to God. She wrote books. She became a philanthropist. She supported churches and church work. There you are. You know what she said? This is what he said. All my life I searched for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but I found what I really needed at the foot of the cross. Huh? You have ever been there at the foot of the cross, folks? where you got to go. There's a haven of rest. You can go there anytime. There is a haven of rest, and it's the foot of the cross. And you don't have to say much. You just find peace, forgiveness, and you just ask for that restoration that you want. The foot of the cross is the highest place on earth. That's the foot of the cross. She found it. She found it. She found it. Marvelous, really. What does God want us to do? I'll, I know you know the text. So I'll just take you through this. I'll just take you through this text. Is it not this kind of fasting? Not the one that they were doing. I have chosen to lose the chains of injustice. Note this. Untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free, break every yoke. Now you say, I don't oppress anybody. Well, start being nice to everybody. Oppression comes in many different ways, folks. Uh, is this not to share your food with the hungry, to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? And it goes on to say, when you see the naked, to close him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Don't neglect your own family, whatever you're doing. This is tremendous, this is a tremendous gospel. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. If you want God to answer your prayers, start living like that. Start living. Let that what you have be a tool. Your light will break forth with the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. I love this statement that he makes. And then your righteousness will go before you because one day, one day, you will be kneeling there in front of him and he places a crown of gold on your head. That's it. That's the promise. And then he goes on to say, and the glory of the Lord, that is the character of the Lord, will be your rear guard. You know, the rear guard protects you. He gets behind you and he puts his rope of righteousness over you. And you stand there and there's a judgment and it means nothing. Because, well, it means everything. It means you haven't sinned. Yes, you have your whole life. But it means that you have surrendered, that you have accepted. You have accepted his righteousness. You have learned not just to overcome. You have learned to love him back. That's what it is. And so, uh, and so it is. We have a special item, and uh, I'm looking forward to that item. I'm, I'm looking forward to this, that when you will call, the, the prophet says, the Lord will answer, you will cry for help, and this is what he will say. If you really want that prayer life, if you do what you're supposed to do, he will say to you, here am I. You feel he's present. You know he is listening. 
Because your life is changing, right? This is for the good. And this is, this is the, the, the closing statement. When earthly things shall have passed away, the watchers of heaven's gates will bid you welcome. And may that be in the case of every single person here. How good would that be? God bless you. Thanks, Peter. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his hand, his hand, and to be the king of a vast Peter, that was beautiful. Folks, can we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, it is true. We are impressed with this wonderful truth. We would rather have Jesus than anything else. Help us to keep this in our minds, in our hearts. Help us to live that as we leave this place. That this week we will take that direction where you want us to go. Live that life you want us to live. Help us to live the life of Jesus. Help us to care. Help us to be right. Help us to be true. 
Help us never to give up. Even if we fail, we'll come back to you. You know that. Because we have nowhere else to go but you. We indeed rather have Jesus than anything else. Lord, we thank you for your presence whilst we were here. We pray that you bless the food that is outside there, the hands that prepared it, the fellowship that we enjoy with one and another. We look forward to that day when Jesus comes bursting through the clouds. We'd like to go home. Thank you for being our God. Amen.